Hi, everyone. The conversations have been great so far. I'm Jen Smith. I'm the head of automotive partnerships here at Ampersand. In my role, I get to work with fantastic clients at the OEM level as well as the agency level. And I really love to help them connect the TV landscape from a planning and a measurement um, across all the tiers. So I'm excited to introduce to you today one of my, my all of our mutual friends, Steve St. Germain, as part of today's panel discussion, focusing on that amazing title Ethan just said, changing lanes, an audience first and across tier approach. Um, I've crossed paths with Steve over the last few years at a, of various roles of his. I'm gonna let him do the talking, but as you'll see, he's um, very energetic and knowledgeable uh, on, this, on the subject of all things media. So with that, Steve, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, thanks, Ethan, for the quick intro. Uh, it's good to be here. So um, I wanna yeah, thank Brandon Vitters for having me. And yeah, a little bit about my background. I've uh, been working in automotive marketing for about 12 years. Uh, spent a good nine or so years at the agency side, coming up on my third year here at Stellantis. Uh, I've worked on Alfa Romeo, Dodge, and now Jeep here at Stellantis. In my prior lives, I've worked on uh, you know Lincoln Motor Company, Ford Motor Company, and a few of our other competitors. So, uh, you know, my my area of expertise has always been media, whether it's social media, traditional or digital. So this is, you know, generally the lens that I like to look at things through. And it's been, you know, the landscape has changed a lot in, in those 10 or 12 years that even I've been working on it. And uh, it's it's just an exciting field. And here we are in 2022. And the landscape is, you know, changing every day, every month. And it's just, uh, it's fun to hop on and, and talk about it a little bit. as I'm muted. Before we get into all things Stellantis, Steve, why don't we chat a little bit about landscape of our lives that is not involving our work. You and I were chatting about having a three-year-olds and well, on our side, side hobbies, mine involves traveling with them or without them. But when I'm with them, we tend to go do all things Disney or characters. And Steve was, was joking that his hobby is a little different than mine. Uh, so Steve, go ahead and, and talk talk about what you do in your spare time besides media. Yeah, I mean, I I do a lot. I'm fairly active in rock climbing and running and, and different things like that. I try to stay physically active, right? You have to, it's mind body balance, but, um, and then uh, try to flex my creative muscle a little bit. Um, I do sort of as a hobby, I do some amateur photography, um, picked up drone piloting a few years back just to sort of advance that hobby and have a lot of fun with it. So. Uh, I like to think I have a little bit of a creative side, and um, and yes, we both have three year olds, so we're we're both running around in our evenings, and uh, we did a party for for my third my uh, three year old yesterday. That was a lot of fun too. So thanks for yeah. mentioning that. For sure. Well, why don't we get into the landscaping of of our of our job? So I'll let you go ahead and talk a little bit about where Salantis is these days, and and give an update, and we can really dive into our discussion today. Yeah, for sure. So as I mentioned, it's twenty twenty two. Uh, we're basically living in the future, but uh, Jeep is still a, a big leader in the SUV market, right? From small Jeeps like Renegade and, and Gladiator and Compass, all the way up to our iconic Wrangler that most people know us for, um, but all the way up to the large SUVs like our new, all new Grand Cherokee L three row. Uh, and then our, our recent introduction of the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. So, you know, Jeep obviously has this go anywhere mentality. Um, and we spend a lot of time making sure that when we show up, you know, we do so with the right messaging, that we're telling this Jeep story as authentically as possible. And, you know, we looked at, you know, the market and all the different segments that we play in. And, and you know, we're, we're a core SUV brand, but uh, the one place that we're able to expand is in the large SUV market. Right, so we have this amazing foundation we've built on for over 80 years of four by four and off-road leadership. And you know, what better place uh, than the large SUV market to, um, to reintroduce the Wagoneer name. And so we're, we're doing so in a really special way. And uh, it's a different type of category. It's more luxury based. And uh, the detail that has went into the design of the Jen, I think you might be by yourself now. 
Oh, did we lose Steve? I wasn't sure if it was my internet connection here or no, Steve. I, I think we might have lost Steve for a moment. So I thought I would uh, come in and say hello so you weren't alone. Yeah, no, I'm I'm happy. I was just listening to Wagoneer. I think some of us may recall the Wagoneers of the 80s. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really excited to see that Wagoneer's back with a much more sophisticated and um, large SUV entry into the category. I think it's if you've seen any of them, they're amazingly beautiful vehicles. So I'm, I'm hopeful Steve can share a little more insight as to what they're doing. Some of the things that he and I have chatted about are, are how, how is the Wagoneer elevating the brand experience and how is it elevating the dealer's experience with the customer? As we, as we get into the panel and talk about cross-tier, you're going to see how they've taken a unique approach to their, their cross-tier um, measurement and support for targeting customers interested in Wagoneer and all things cheap. So he's got some interesting things to say. Hopefully he joins back in a minute. Um, but mm -hmm. Ethan, I don't know if you wanna uh, talk about anything we've sort of prepped for the panel or we should just wait for Steve another minute or two. No, we can wait for Steve another minute or two. I'm sure he'll jump back in. Uh, I, am a, uh, I am a Jeep owner myself. So uh, nice. I was actually looking at a Wagoneer, uh, perhaps a little too nice for me. I've got three kids <laughs> right. uh, and those kids are, uh, they tear up my Grand Cherokee. So I think a Grand Cherokee L might be, uh, might be what I'm looking at uh, the next time I need to go bigger. Yeah, well, and you're gonna hear how they're changing some of the dealer experiences on how you go about purchasing your next vehicle uh, as it relates to Jeep and, and being a little more, um, uh, direct to consumer. There's some pretty interesting things sort of happening. Um, Steve said he will be back in one minute. His computer just crashed. So um, hopefully that, that minute is now up. So I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, working through the uh, AV issues that, that there, Steve has come up with. There is no way to predict what will befall us in the virtual environment. Uh, I, we appreciate everybody kind of uh, hanging in with us uh, as we tap dance our way around this. Uh, <laughs> it is uh, it is very much uh, much appreciated. Yeah, I think that the work from home challenges are um, there's so many uh, benefits to working from home, and then there's so many challenges and things that could um, could could go wrong. Yes, absolutely. Well, if you if you believe our background. We all look like we're working from some kind of blob uh, <laughs> type of uh, type of room today. Um, uh, so yes, uh, there's no telling what's going to happen. Yeah, this is this is live TV here. And uh, Tom Dempsey, uh, I appreciate the support from the uh, from the chat, my friend. It's good to hear from you. Oh, thank you, Davina. That would be something we'd love to talk about, Jen. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I think one of the questions that Davina posed to us is just how are we working within the auto category right now? And one of the things, and you'll see the theme on this panel is, is cross-tier. One of the pieces we're working is really to help our customers connect some of the dots across tiers. Not only does Ampersand have an amazing addressable TV offering, and we work with a lot of you on the, on the line, we also have um, our, our, our core business of our local linear product. And so what one of the things I'm really trying to do with my team is connect some of those dots. Now those dots may, the um, OEM advertiser usually um, cares about some of those. So Steve, I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, but one of the things he's really going to be talking about today is how do you bridge some of that gap together? How do you bridge the national TV buying with what they're what's happening on local? And so we're able to do more measurement than ever before, and we're able to show lift in sales in bet between the tier one and the tier two um, world. So I'll let, hopefully Steve will be able to elaborate a little bit more on cross-tier advertising and some of the work we've been doing together. But um, with that, I'll let, I'll, looks like Steve is back. So I will I'm so I will stop tap dancing. I will, <laughs> uh, Steve take over. 
I will bid you adieu. <laughs> oh man, sorry about that. I lost my connection. I'm fully back. And let's, Jen. I was doing my intro, but let's pick up where wherever you see fit. I know. Yeah. We, nope. We you were talking minutes. about Wagoneer, and I, we were just kind of going. So I think we're we've all chatted through Wagoneer. I've given a little more about your perspective. So why don't you get okay. into some of what's happening in the global perspective, and then we can really talk about some of the 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 custom content that's coming. I did tease some of our cross tier reasons we are doing this panel. So I, I think the group's excited to get into it based on some of the things um, I've teased. Okay, excellent. So we're back. Um, anyways, let's talk, let's talk about like the global automotive industry. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about Jeep, a little bit about Wagoneer, but this industry that we're within is experiencing major disruption. Right. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have to tell you guys that, but it's clear like there's more disruption that's on the way. And, you know, I feel like Jeep is in a pretty good position here. We had the foresight back in 2019 to merge two, uh, you know, global companies together. That was PSA Group and FCA Group. We're now the fourth largest automaker in the world, 14 brands under our belt. But with that comes renewed technology, a renewed vision, a new roadmap. And a big part of that disruption is EV. Right. So Jeep, Jeep has a great EV story to tell, and I'm proud to tell it. Uh, four by E is the moniker that we use for our battery powered drivetrains. Uh, in 2020, we first announced that we were going to electrify the iconic Wrangler. We've done so. It, it began going on sale last year. It quickly became the number one best selling hybrid EV in the United States. Still is. It makes up about 18 percent of all Wrangler sales. So we're really proud of that. And then last year, we also announced that we're bringing that same 4 by e hybrid technology to the Jeep Grand Cherokee. And we revealed that last year. We just brought it to New York Auto Show. So we're just coming off of that. You're going to start to see that actually on sale and on the roads this summer. Beyond that, we've also already announced a fully all-electric BEV, all-new Jeep for 2023. So that'll go on sale next year. And we're also electrifying our entire lineup. So I don't think that this would have been possible without, uh, you know, the foresight of, of merging two incredible companies together, coming up with new platforms and new ways to approach. That's from an industry perspective. We're here with our marketing hats on, with our media hats on. So in terms of our marketing approach, Jen, if you don't mind, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about this and then you can get me into the nitty gritty, right? But uh, in terms of a marketing approach, you're gonna see us show up all across the marketplace in culture, some culture's biggest moments. Uh, we just finished up a March Madness program with, with spots during the Final Four in the championship game, as well as the digital simulcasts. Uh, you saw us at the Academy Awards with a, a spot that we love. It's called Earth Odyssey. And it's a playoff of Stanley Kubrick's uh, classic film, 2021 Space Odyssey. Uh, we're still a legacy sponsor of X Games. We've done that for over 10 years now. Uh, we're executing con custom content programs, vehicle integrations. We do a ton of performance marketing. So you name it, we're looking into it. And I will say, besides this, in the last three years, things have gotten really interesting when it comes to data, audiences, programmatic activations. And we have some new thinking on this, right? So we, we took a step back and said, uh, you know, this purchase funnel that that we've been using and that, and that a, lot of, a lot of people use is, is a little bit antiquated. And, and that's how we're looking at our media strategy. And it's, it's less about the actual channel and more just about the person that we're trying to reach and that the message that we show up with, right? So um, COVID has accelerated a lot of this thinking around customer journeys and uh, they're incredibly complex and are, and, you know, essentially we, we built like activation strategies to match them. And we're slowly sort of evolving away from this antiquated funnel into a much more sophisticated way to reach people. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. And, and I love all the, you know, brand alignment that you do with X Games and the things you mentioned. As we talk really about the customer journey today and that funnel sort of going away, I think all of our behaviors as consumers has changed, especially over the last three years. And when you dropped, um, Ethan and I were talking a little bit about the the customer journey as, as he's a jeep owner how is that going to change potentially someday at the dealership so before we get to the dealer piece let's really talk about how do you reach the right consumer at the right time and 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 how is the funnel not necessarily a funnel any longer yeah 
Exactly. This is this is actually some of uh, the most exciting work I think that we're doing. Uh, a lot of it's spurred from thinking that's been done by our agency of record or media agency of record, Publicist Collective. Um, so shout out to shout out to them if uh, any of them are watching. But um, so I mentioned the funnel, and you know I think we all know how that sort of looks on paper, right? You have awareness at the top, consideration in the middle, and purchase intent at the very bottom. The goal of marketers generally to get people into the funnel and get it through the funnel so they can purchase and convert. Uh, what we're finding is like a lot of the purchasing power, you know, within domestically within the United States is shifting to millennials, Gen Z, and it doesn't make sense to necessarily build a plan around the old funnel. Um, and it's it's not as linear as we as we once thought, right? It's more cyclical. So I'll give you an example. Like, you know, we used to imagine that someone would see an ad on TV might spur them to, you know, do a search and land on our site and then eventually make it into a dealership where our sales guys would like close the sale. And, you know, we know that that happens and that model still exists, but it's not the most common way that, you know, someone purchases a vehicle. So a lot of this decisioning is, is happening in a totally different fashion, right? Where someone may never land on our brand website before buying one of our vehicles, right? They're, they're going from like point A to D and skipping B and C. So they've watched enough YouTube reviews or they've talked to enough friends that they've, they've figured out that this vehicle is for them. And that's fantastic. And we, and we fully support that. So um, aside from that sort of method, there, there are, you know, we, we do still put a lot of support into our online experiences. And there's plenty of people that, that do land on our site. So we have the, the build and price tools and some different shopping tools for them. Uh, a lot of people we find that do hit our site, visit it many, many times. The people that hit the site, they, when they're when they're close to purchase, they are expecting, and this is the expectation of consumers today, a modern retail experience, right? This is the generation of Amazon and one-click buying. So, as as automakers with you know a large dealership network and um, you know a different sort of model, we have to be thinking about how we you know adapt and and close the loop with some of these consumers. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. You know, we we titled this panel on purpose, an audience first and a cross tier approach for a reason, right? I think that what you just mentioned is, is so important. How does that cross tier approach where you mentioned the dealer um, visits look different than maybe they have or they will in the future? How do you, how do you handle that from a media perspective? If, the t if, if you're looking at the journey holistically and then how does that ha happen when, you, when tr traditionally we've had tier one and tier two advertising, how does, how does that change on, on your side of the house? Yeah. So the, the sort of tiered advertising, it, it works like this, right? You have tier one, which is your, your blanket Jeep branding at the very top. Your tier two is specifically put there more on a regional or local level to tell you that we have a great deal and, you know, Jeep has great offers out there. And then tier three is generally at the dealer level where they're literally telling you to come on down and that they've got it in stock, right? So that's sort of the tiered model. Uh, we looked at this model and said, is anyone out there actually going to know, you know, where, if, if, if you see Jeep out in the marketplace, are you, are you going to know, you know, which tier that that came from or, or who bought it? Or do you even care? Okay. So the answer is no, no one will care. What they do know is if it's something that they like, or it's something that they're interested in. So this, this basically, you know, takes the onus on us as the marketer to do the creative thinking with right message, right time, right? So we combine these strategies that were once completely separate organizationally siloed, and we put them all through the same team. And it's truly a, a tierless approach. And, you know, we're finding this, this has a ton of different advantages. Number one, agility. So we can pivot when we identify an opportunity or a threat. It's all under one roof. We don't have to transfer budgets or get corporate approval from coming from one tier to another, right? It's more, there's more fluidity. There's speed to market. So when we pair this with digital tactics or CTV, we can turn markets on or off and get them running in a, just a matter of days. So this allows us to essentially look at our you know, national plan. Perhaps it's our, our linear that we bought up front. We're able to use more, of, more strategically to sort of you know, plug the holes or help complement places within our national plan. And you know, we, we use this all the time. So if we find that if there's a specific DMA or a region that has uh, you know, low inventory for whatever reason, perhaps they oversold. It doesn't make sense for us to be on in such high levels in places with uh, messaging for a nameplate that doesn't, that literally doesn't have the stock, right? So with this method, we can move it to different markets, or perhaps we, you know, if it's, if it's inventory that we're not able to move, we, we keep that weight, we push it to a different nameplate, that one that has, that makes more sense. Yeah. That, oh, okay. yeah, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to say that that makes total sense as you as you have more flexibility and agility. And I think as you're, you know, you're about those methods and, and I think coordination is another big piece of it that I think you want to cover. And, and as we talk about coordination and consistency and consolidation, when though even though the tiers are planned um, more holistically now, how, how do you still work through um, each tier having its own strategy, right? Like you said, tier one is the is the um, mass reach and, and tier two is more of the, the offers tier three. So how do you, how do you look at those audience pieces across as well as coordinate them so that they all make sense at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. No problem. I mean, there's, there's definitely, there's a lot that's differentiated between more of our awareness messaging and our, you know, lower, you know, I'll call it lower funnel, right? But it's our, our more of our local messaging or, or sales direct messaging. But um, there's also a lot of consistencies. So for example, we have a ton of audience suppression in both approaches. Um, you know, this makes sure that we're not reaching anyone who just bought a Jeep. That wouldn't make sense. Or extreme loyalists of other brands, or like in the case of Grand Wagoneer, it's a higher price point. So we don't want to be reaching anyone that either doesn't have the means or even the interest in purchasing uh, something we consider a luxury vehicle. So we're, we're refining suppression a lot, and that, that's a big factor into it. Um, and, you know, there's tons of efficiencies that we carry over even on the strategy side. So, I mean, ultimately, we just want to make sure, number one, that the person is actually in market and meaning that they want to buy an SUV. Uh, number two, that the person has the ability or the means to purchase it. And then number three, just show up with creative that we feel that speaks to them. So, um, you know, we use plenty of combinations of first party data and we have our own first party data. We segment it. We create lookalikes off of it. We do suppression off of it. If it's current owners, we also leverage Epsilon, uh, people cloud, which is proprietary to, uh, our AOR publicist collective that should come as no surprise. And, um, and then we also work with a handful of third parties when we're not able to get something within our own proprietary, you know, data stack. So, I mean, to answer your question, like without giving too much away, the best way that I can, ex you know, explain our approach here or tier list strategy in an activation sense is that we're, we're just generally more stricter and more precise with our sales messaging. And it's where we're willing to pay more of a premium for inventory or where we can focus more on things like addressability, targeted CTV, programmatic video. And these are some of our most uh, important activations in our entire plan. It's also where we have our most focus and where we're doing most of our testing. Yeah, that's really interesting. As you are talking through some of those video challenges or video uh, efficiencies that are gained, um, how do you navigate some of the waters of the changing landscape? You just measured a few, you know, addressable, targeted CTV, programmatic. None of those things are, are new, but how do you balance all of them and how do you navigate those waters of the changing landscape that, that there's more opportunity for you than ever before to reach your customer and it's harder. And so how do you, how do you guys navigate some of these crazy times? Did we lose Steve again or am I? Uh... I, think, uh, I think we lost him again. All right. Um, this is uh, this is a this is a tough one. There's no two ways about it. Um, yes. Well, um, why don't you finish up your thoughts on uh, on what sure. uh, ampersand is doing? Sure. Uh, I was just um, there is a question, so I was just going to read it. Get, just give me a sec to read it, so maybe I can answer it in in uh, lieu of Steve not being here. Um, I think we'll let, let Steve answer some of the creative questions that that come up. Um, so I think, you know, as we were talking about how Ampersand works within our automotive customers, we, we are really trying to connect some of these dots. And as you heard Steve saying that with a tier list strategy, they're able to be more nimble. And so things that Ampersand personally provides them or can is sales matchback data across tiers and really understanding how the addressable media impacts the sales when paired with local. We've done some testing of this um, across the OEM environment, and we've seen that things like addressable and local work really well together. It's not surprising, but putting some of those numbers behind it is really helpful for our customers. And so our team is really focused on 
building some of those automotive partnerships within um, within ampersand and, and beyond and, and really helping our customers understand what their um, linear TV buys get them and, and where we can continue to evolve. Another um, area that Steve and I talked about was multicultural and how how do, are auto advertisers helping and handling the challenging, uh, the challenges that face with delivering messages to the right audience within the multicultural environment? Steve was telling me how they did some studies in the LA market and a lot of the customers there are Spanish speaking. So he and I are working through some of the strategies around while, while there's a lot of uh, planning that goes into the multicultural deployment, how do we, um, while we can't necessarily target some of those customers because of the data regulations in place, how can we potentially measure on the back end? So we're working with our teams across the country to be able to offer some more um, diversification or divert diversity metrics uh, after a campaign has ended of the right audience being hit. Kind of going along what Steve was saying, making sure that the right audience is being um, targeted at the right time. So uh, from the ampersand auto perspective, we're doing a lot of that um, right now and, and working with partners like Steve and other um, brands to help bring some of that to life. Hmm. Are there any other questions I can answer around that? I could, I could talk all day, but I wanna make sure that while Steve is in between uh, computers crashing, I can add any um, color that may need to be added. I think oh, he's looks back. like he's, he's back. All right. Steve. Again. Wow. All right. I'm back. Sorry, Jen. Yeah, no worries. You, I feel bad that you have all these. We've had a lot of calls and have had no tech issues. So I'm sorry that you're experiencing this. What we talked about when you dropped was just how, um, as we work through the cross funnel um, together, what things we can do. So I think it's still um, applicable for you to talk about some of the, the changes that are occurring in the landscape right now, the other opportunities to hit customers. So continue there. And then we did cover a little bit of multicultural. So um, if we don't, if time permits, we'll cover that again, but go ahead with sure. the changing landscape. All right. You got it. Hopefully I uh, won't cut out this time, but no. Um, yeah. The video landscape, video landscape is wild. Video landscape has changed dramatically. I mean, even in the last five years, in the last couple of years, um, you know, We've seen how many new streaming services launch uh, on, you know, on the short form side of video, right? We have like these portrait formats. You have TikTok, Instagram Reels, Stories. YouTube has a product now. And it's just, it's an incredible, incredibly con complex landscape. Uh, you know, we've never had as many choices and, and um, never had as much access to, to content as we have um, like we do today. So there has to be some sort of magic in this delivery, right? So it's similar to the tier, like people don't care who, you know, which tier of the business like bought the ad. Also consumers don't, you know, really care like how the ad got there, right? So it's just up to us, you know, to figure out how to get it in front of the consumer at the right time. Um, so we, we do this in a bunch of different ways, like the, you know, Part of it is efficiency. So when we're buying across, you know, this requires us to buy across a lot of different inventory sources and making sure that we're, you know, covering off on all these different networks. We don't want to have any blind spots. So um, there's a lot of things that, um, you know, that our agency helps with in terms of efficiencies. A lot of this stuff is bought upfront. Like when you're talking AVOD, you know, AVOD networks and uh, CTV and, and linear, and then you can also have the scatter market. So we'll, we'll purchase sometimes on a quarterly basis. But um, what, what sort of helped in this way, right? When we're looking at like all the different places to be within video, there's like mass, not only like our, like our own merger, right? There's a ton of like mergers and consolidation that are happening within the media landscape as well. So, um, you know, XM and, uh, and Sirius, you know, combined to be like the one place to go for satellite radio. Um, you know, Verizon purchased Yahoo not long ago. AT&T scooped up Time Warner. Time Warner scooping up uh, Discovery and uh, and so on and so on. So not only, but so there, there may be a lot of fragmentation, but there's a good amount of consolidation at the top that, that can make sometimes um, buying a little bit easier. And actually in the case of Ampersand, you guys have, um, you guys help us out with this quite a bit too, just because you have hooks into to so many different sources. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was going to mention that. I think that's really important that, you know, consolidation is is great and it's also challenging. Um, is my internet freezing too now? It seems like it, it seems like the panel is uh, having a lot of AV issues, but yeah, you're right. What about emerging um, in the future of video as things kind of, I know this is one of the topics you really love to chat about, but as the, as the future of video is, is changing, like you mentioned, um, wh wh where are we? How do we evolve from that? And then how do you as Stellantis help and Jeep figure that out? Yeah, I mean, when we're talking media overall, you're right, Jen, I do love talking about this topic, right? Like, uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, emerging media meant mobile tablet. And, you know, then came a ton of video and, and digital video. And, uh, you know, generally media follows hardware, right? So there's a ton of innovation happening around hardware right now. With hardware comes new software. With software comes media experiences, right? So we're looking really closely at the, you know, VR and what's happening with Facebook slash Meta um, and also AR. We, we know that Apple is, is um, looking to get into that space. So what type of media implications does that have? I mean, you can have you know, we could be looking at 360 degree video formats. So shooting with like a 360 camera array, uh, we could be talking spatial audio or 3D models that people can interact with. If we're talking metaverse, you know, you can imagine what an immersing, immersive drive experience might look like, or um, what even like walking around a showroom might be, or having Stellantis or Jeep show up in a, in sort of a gamified way. Right. So um, that, and you know, that's not even touching on like blockchain and NFTs and all that fun stuff that, that, you know, does sort of have media implications. So, um, you know, best, best we can do, um, you know, short of testing in this space is just to to stay really informed and um, you know to educate ourselves and to to watch what other folks are doing right for for um, case studies and, and best practices yeah and for anyone on the line Steve is very passionate about all these things so feel free to outreach to him as he's uh, up and coming in all the futuristic way video and, and advertising involves. Um, shifting gears a little bit, while you were off, we talked about some multicultural, and one of the stats you shared with me was that in LA, you found that um, Spanish Spanish um, speakers were in LA that more and more with a more penetration that you had expected. Could you talk a little bit about your multicultural outreach in general? What I had mentioned when you were gone was that some of the things Ampersand is working on are um, back end measurement, but talk about the front end planning and how the you might mention millennials, but let's talk about how multicultural fits into your overall plan as well. Yeah, for sure. So we look at multicultural in a few different ways. Like first off, we have a really excellent team built here uh, at Stellantis. That entire focus is on multicultural and they help us understand how we can think about the different audiences and all the different media placements and things we can do there, right? So we're working with them. We, we're developing custom content for both Hispanic, and that means like Spanish language, uh, as well as African-American tailored uh, creative and partnerships and custom content uh, You know, for those audiences. One, one stat that I actually have written down here that I thought was interesting was that like year over year for, for our Grand Cherokee, our Hispanic audiences have grown and grown and grown and grown 10 years straight. Whereas when we look back in 10 years, the, the amount of, amount of uh, Hispanic Americans that are purchasing Grand Cherokee has tripled. So it's not something that I mean, even like from a business sense, um, you know, th these are audiences that we need to be thinking about. And then we obviously just want to make sure that we're sensitive and that we're that we're coming at them um, in the right way, like culturally. So uh, another example of this, like within uh, African-American audiences, we just partnered with The Grio, which is an African-American news site. They're part of Allen Media Group. Uh, we're also promoting groups like one of my favorite, uh, the Black Jeepers of Detroit, and we featured them on our Instagram page and gave them some love because they do meetups all over the city. Um, you know, we're running across Univision and ESPN Deportes from a, a national and even a local level. And, you know, I mentioned this stuff and we talk about the tierless strategy, but uh, we're utilizing, you know, this across the spectrum in the same way. It's, it's, you know, we're not putting it in a corner or just doing it to check a box. It's, uh, you know, there's just, it's amazing how much diversity there is, not only within the U.S., but also within, among Jeep owners and within our own community. So we're constantly thinking about it. Great. Well, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to open it up to any Q&A. 
Um, if anybody has a question, um, please feel free to put it in the chat pod. Steve, one that came over um, while you were gone was um, when we you sort of started teasing the world of online shopping and then Ethan came in and said that he's expanding and potentially looking at a Wagoneer. How has that process and how, and how does your messaging change as the go-to-market, um, I, I kind of ad-libbed there a little bit. The question was around, the specific question was, how does your messaging change in the world of online shopping? So if you want to take that. Yeah, for sure. Oh, this one's this one's huge. Like I mentioned, uh, you know, different audiences, like especially younger audiences, they're um, they're the generation of Amazon and one click buy, and it's it's an interesting insight. You know, not a lot of good came out of COVID, right? But um, we actually had uh, an online retail experience, our ORE as we called it internally, that um, that launched shortly after all of our dealerships shut down. So we had to pivot real quick and we essentially became an online retailer overnight. Uh, we call this experience eShop. It's out there right now. It's our online shopping hub. And um, you'll see us do a lot more in this space uh, for obvious reasons. But, um, you know, there's, a, there's also a lot of challenges with this. Like from a consumer perspective, you're uh, essentially like simplifying the process. On the back end, on the measurement side, I mean, we're beginning to look at measures that like digital retailers have looked at for years, things like cart abandonment, right? And, and eShop brings like this whole new suite of net new metrics that we have that we can evaluate along with our brand site and you know, tying them back uh, to conversion to sales and all those sorts of things. So it's a, it's actually an exciting angle um, in terms of like retail and buying online that, uh, that we're just starting to explore. So it's pretty cool. Sure. Great. One question that came in, Steve, about multicultural, and you and I did talk about this in our in our, our many conversations was, do you separate the Spanish dominant versus the bicultural consumers when targeting and placing your, uh, media with your creative? So elaborate a little bit on how the creative um, is handled as it relates to multicultural. Yeah, I mean, in the the answer is sort of yes or no. In digital, in digital, definitely yes. We're doing a lot more in terms of targeting. So, like, we, we wouldn't want someone who doesn't speak Spanish to to see our you know Spanish transcoded ad, obviously. But um, like in in markets like you know Miami uh, per se, if there are specific regions where we're doing some more spot buying, uh, we can look at the population, see that the majority of them uh, are Hispanic or or Latina or Latino, and we're able to you know, serve our Spanish language to, you know, that population, because the majority of them, uh, you know, are, dom are Spanish dominant speaking. So uh, it depends on the channel, but, but yes. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. Um, we've talked a lot about audience um, as it relates to the um, title of our panel, Cross Screen and Audience. Um, but one of the questions was, how do you find the audience? And then how do you build brand uh, awareness and loyalty? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different ways out there. I mean, digital, as we sort of talked about, is, is pretty sophisticated. In terms of loyalty and you mentioned awareness, I mean, there's a there's a ton that we do in this space. Uh, we, we still you know, purchase a lot of linear TV up front. Uh, we still participate in that process. And, you know, as you can see, if, if you ever tune in to broadcast or cable TV, we have pretty healthy schedules. Uh, so that definitely helps with, uh, general awareness. We do a lot in CTV as well on the awareness side. And, um, you know, generally when we're showing up with those types of strategies, we're doing more about pushing like our broad messages and basically what's Jeep up to. So those are things like the Wagoneer launch that I mentioned or the electrification of our lineup. Uh, we also, you know, this year we launched some pretty cool out of home placements. So we, we selected about 10 different DMAs. You'll see them up across walls from New York to LA to Dallas. We've got some in Detroit. Those have been really fun. So you'll be able to see a Wagoneer on a, on a huge wallscape and those oh. will help with awareness. And uh, in terms of loyalty as well, I mean, we're still really heavily involved in events like Easter Jeep Safari, which, which we just kicked off a couple of weeks ago in Moab, Utah. And we look to support like, as many organic Jeep meetups as we can. So we keep current owners engaged and loving the products as much as we do. That's great. Okay, last question. I think it's a good one. What are you most excited about as we head into the rest of the year? 
Um, I'm excited for like warm weather here in Detroit. It's uh, it's been pretty rough. Um, but no, I, I'm just excited to. I'm actually excited to see what a lot of competitors are up to. Uh, we're we're at a we're at sort of a. It's an early stage in the game, but it's also there's a lot of EVs that are maturing, right? So there's announcements all the time. If you if you read some of the automotive trades, I mean, they're on fire. There's never been announcements um, like there has been before. And we're finding a lot of consolidation. You know, we're not all going to make it. I hate to say that, but um, the automotive industry is, a, is an incredibly crowded, uh, crowded space, right? And, and you can imagine that not all the OEMs will have the ability to electrify and, and to find their way. So there'll probably be a lot of consolidation. I'm just really curious how a lot of this stuff shakes out. Um, the best we can do is, you know, put our heads down, do the best work that we can and, and, you know, try to reach people in the right ways. Uh, I like to think that we're doing a good job with that. So uh, I'm a big reader of news and, you know, I'm just excited about, I'd say the auto industry in general, and then obviously the, the evolution of our own industry, right? We're moving away from cookies and multi-touch yeah. attribution, and we're just getting smarter and smarter. So, um, yes. you know, I, I'd say that'd be it. Great. Well, thank you so much. I, I will, um, I really appreciate all of the time and learning more about your cross tier strategy and your audience strategy as it relates to all things video and beyond. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Ethan if there's any last minute questions or if we're going to turn it over to the next group. Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, Steve, my thanks uh, for you joining us today. Uh, also, just as a focus group of one, kudos. I've got a uh, I've got a Grand Cherokee lease that's coming up before too long, and I've been getting a lot of wagon ear messages, which uh, is pretty much exactly what I'm thinking about. Except it might just be a little too nice for my kids. <laughs> if you saw the inside of my Grand Cherokee, uh, you might not want me messing up your beautiful new wagon ear quite like that. But uh, but uh, someone's doing a good job getting the message where it needs to be. I love it. You know, that's the, it's the first product we have with Amazon Fire in the rear passenger seat. So depending on their age, they might get a kick out of it. I, I think they definitely would. That's uh, my kids too. Can't wait. <laughs> I'm, I'm always looking for something to keep them uh, to keep them occupied. So I'm definitely that's another another check in its column. That's great to hear. Hey, Ethan, reach out if uh, if you need anything. Awesome. I appreciate that very much. Thanks for joining us, Steve and Jenny. Thanks, Steve. Uh, really well done. Thank, Thank you so you. very much.